because I feel a little bit like the odd one out, but I'm really thrilled to take you to some works that I've done on curiosity in non-humans and also how a social life might play a role for that. So, okay. So this is a field assistant. He just puts his GoPro down on the floor because he's picking up something from his backpack. And this vervet monkey, if you would ask people how to describe this monkey with one word, a lot of people would probably say curious. Yet it's quite, uh, it's quite ironic because we are not talking much about curiosity in the animal cognition literature. And I would argue that even if we don't talk about it, people have studied this in many different ways anyhow. And so we have seen throughout this workshop that there's a lot of different definitions and terminology out there about what curiosity really is. And so the realm where I find myself in is animal minds. So I cannot assess their knowledge gap and I cannot have their own assessment of what their desires are and how they feel about their own curiosity regarding things. But what I can do is I can try to measure things that has been referred to as observable curiosity through explorative behaviors. And so we're dealing with a much broader definition that it's an internal drive to seek out information about something unfamiliar. And with this broad definition, it has been shown in humans that curiosity can relate to stress and mental well-being, memory capacity, and also to creativity. But we really don't know much about this in other beings, except for humans. And so even if scientists across different disciplines seems to align on the fact that curiosities, the biological function seems to be to foster learning processes. It then follows quite naturally that we would expect curiosity also in all kinds of intelligent systems, also beyond humans. And so we've now very familiar with this famous saying, curiosity killed a cat. And we might disagree on it in some ways since we have seen a lot of talks about the benefits of curiosity, but I think it still illustrates what kind nicely why animals can't express curiosity always. And also let me put it the other way, why aren't wild animals curious? Because it comes with a lot of limitations. So in natural environments, there's full of hazards, there's a lot of, of things to be aware of and careful about. So it, it, these limitations shows that evolution should in fact not favor curiosity in all circumstances. And therefore animals and humans for that matter as well have this function of neophobia that's actually avoiding uncertainty and new things as a protection mechanism to actually not risk your lives. On the other side of the coin, you can say that exploring something new is highly beneficial and you will, will provide you with some new information regarding a food resource or depending on the ecological niche of an animal, you might need it to even develop your foraging strategies to interact with things. And this is what we call attraction towards novelty, neophilia or exploration tendency. So an ev evolutionary perspective, Selection works to balance these traits on a species level, when to be curious and when not to. But it also happens within species, in certain uh, habitats, certain environments, and also within individuals. And so my research is looking at these traits at different levels. So I'm very interested in ape curiosity and how that can tell us something about our evolutionary roots to it and how much human-like curiosity apes have. And then I study vervet monkeys to look at influence of different environments on curiosity and also other cognitive traits. So we're just setting up a project where we look at urbanization and how that affects all of this. And then I stepped out of primatology and looking at meerkats to get a wholesome picture of how social influences on motivational traits affects cognition, but also fitness outcomes in the end. So when you ask a non-primatologist, most people would say, yeah, but great apes are super curious creatures and they can invent anything. Haven't you seen on YouTube this? Haven't you seen that? They're very innovative. 
And this kind of picture comes from the fact that we are we all read about Curious George and we have been in the zoos and we have seen all this. But it's only part of a, of a bigger story where it shows us the potential they have, but in fact, in the wild, they're absolutely, surprisingly non-curious about new stuff. And I will talk a little bit about this in greater details, but there was actually a recent study to find that they are also not curious about familiar stuff if it appears in a certain context that they don't expect the confirmative, confirmative and conservativeness is overruling a potential curiosity. So I studied this in wild orangutans in both Borneo and Sumatra. And it's quite challenging because orangutans are living high up in the trees. So you are, in order to actually get into their world, you need to climb. And so we climbed up there and pretended to make orangutan nests. And on those nests, we would put out some novel objects to induce some exploration behavior. And we then put up video camera traps that would get triggered every time an orangutan would visit such a platform and explore the objects. And we choose objects that were not even that conspicuous, which so is just slightly a bit different to what they otherwise would encounter, except for the Swiss flag, I guess. And so I'll just show you how that looks like when orangutans are no. Well, it's not that important, this video, because I can imitate what she's doing. <laughs> so she's hanging there and she's doing absolutely nothing. And she turns around and looks at, yeah, if you can. Then. Oh yeah, yeah, so you'll see, I'm not gonna spoil it. It's not the action movie, but. So this is the plastic flowers and yeah, she has a glimpse, but you know, you cannot become any more uninterested, so to speak. She's absolutely not thrilled by this, and there's no point to go in to look at this item further. And in fact, the orangutans were so uncurious that after having these platforms with these novel objects there for over a hundred days, we only recorded one single case where we had a physical exploration of these items. And as many times in primatology, this is an anecdotal thing that then pops an idea in your head. And like this special case was one of our very habituated individuals who was observing my field assistant, putting up stuff and repairing the platform and then approach it. So it was a social interaction drawing the attention. And so to get a little bit more insight into what happens in captive apes and how they appear to be so much more creative, we did a second study where we tested orangutans from both zoos and sanctuaries. And these guys differ widely in their experiences. So some of them have been born in the wild and then transferred to sanctuary. Some of them have been born in the sanctuary, others have been pets or circus animals and treated very badly. And then we have mother reared peer group apes that are called the normal captive apes. And then we have some bottle fed. So they're very much variation in especially those early years of life when these traits are believed to develop to a certain extent. So to somehow quantify their previous experience with humans, since it um, varied so much, we did a human orientation test and we just measure how much interest they have in a human they've never seen before. So they shouldn't have a special social um, interaction with. And it's, we found quite a bit of variation across these groups, but they all over the place, except for the ones that have been born in the wild, who seems to be a lot, lot less human oriented. And we then gave the same orangutans a new problem to solve. So it's a honey trap where they, they see this for the very first time. There is absolutely no familiarization trial. They get different tools and they're gonna find out how to fish out honey with the different tools. And what we find was that the ones that are more human oriented explore much longer they also explore with a much more creative way. So they try out much more different things. 
And because of that, they are also more successful in solving the problem at the end. So it's like this pathway between human orientation makes you explorative, makes you successful in this type of problem solving. So this is then this captivity effect or captivity bias, if you like, is not unique to primates. There's been studies on cockatoos where they show that the ones that were um, wild caught were a lot slower to innovate and be successful in uh, tasks demanding exploration compared to a real wild one. And same for hyenas. So this is pretty much the same, like the ones who have uh, have a life in the wild are very much slower in the exploration or in diversity of exploration and therefore appear to be not as good as yet. And so within the literature, the argument is that, well, wild animals are more occupied with foraging and they have predators to be vigilant about and they simply has no time <laughs> and, and also more, less energy to actually yeah, have really time to be innovative or curious. And so the argument goes that this also sort of have a cognitive load on them, that they are not free in thinking about things like uh, demands curious. But we were thinking also about the results from the orangutan study that it seems like you can have cross-species social interaction. So when you're habituated to humans, you use them as social cues and social signals as well. So to look dig into details in this. I studied vervet monkeys from three different categories. I have those in the captivity who have been with humans from week one or two. They're very much used to, to being handled and close to humans. And then we have wild habituated one where we can walk up to one, two meters and walk around them. They're very much used to human observers. And we have wild unhabituated ones that we cannot even go close to. So we have to get the data through video camera traps. And we do this with the Incavo Vervet project. There's multiple groups. And also within these groups, they differ in how far away they are from villages. So the exposure they have to, to different type of humans. So again, to sort of standardize their experiences, we did a habituation index test. We're just simply testing how individuals of a certain groups like to eat close to a human putting down a food box. And we then tested them on a whole test set of different new stuff. So everything from really natural objects like seashells that do not occur in their habitat and the savanna, but also more uh, plastic things. And, and yeah, there's all kind of, of smelly stuff and, and things in there. And we were recording their reactions in terms of approaches and exploration in terms of manipulation, sniffing, touching, lifting, and trying to chew uh, the items. And what we find is that the, the captive ones, of course, as expected, are approaching it, almost all of them, uh, uh, all the time. And the wild habituated ones approach more than the wild unhabituated ones. So this is quite interestingly because both of these group, groups are living in the same habitat and they are both exposed to the same sort of foraging challenges and also potential dangers. Then within the habituated groups and the captive ones, where we were able to collect this habituation index, we can't get close enough to the wild habit unhabited, so that's why they're missing here. We found that this also sort of correlates exactly with their exploration tendencies. So then what have we learned so far from, so from the primate studies is that because they have long life, we would expect this neophobia to protect them from danger and that they should only be, there are certain conditions that then are eliciting and giving room for curiosity and exploration. And one of these things is living in captive environments where things are safe. But that there's also more to this part of the story that that also provides you social inputs on what uh, to be curious about. So if we then try to translate that into what's going on in the natural social life of a species, you would think that the presence of associates is a trustworthy uh, source of information. And so we developed the social information hypothesis. And in line with this, then, if you're a species that grew up 
where you're always and constantly in a network of other individuals, you are constantly having social information available to you, you should actually have to have a less intrinsic curiosity. I'm talking now about when you are on your own, so that you, the more solitary you are, the more dependent you will be to have this drive to go out and find out about the world on your own. And the others should be still equally curious when they are in social context. So to address this question, I jump back to the apes. And the great thing about them is that they have very different social lives. So you have two different orangutan species. In the Borneo, they are quite drastically solitary. In Sumatra, they're still a very solitary species compared to the pan genus, yet they do form a lot more partisan and gregarious groups. And then we have chimpanzees and bonobos that live more or less fish and fusion, but also more stable community lives, especially the, the popular uh, communities of the bonobos. And then we tested them on three different curious contexts. So how much they would like a new food. This is blue potato mash topped with black olives. Some for your cereals, Julia. And then we have the toy that is just a simple toy. There's no food you can get from it or anything. And it's just something to explore that they haven't seen before. And again, the human orientation test. And we tested in quite a large sample for apes. So it's a above 100 individuals just about and because we want to control for the social facilitation here i tested them alone and we can test them in the captive environments where they have more or less similar lives compared to the ecology that plays a big part in nature of course so what we find is there's all kind of measurements in how they explore the items number of different actions and, and latencies and stuff are all explained in one variable where is the human orientation loaded as a second axis. And the PC1, the curiosity component, would then actually quite align with the different social systems among these apes. So that orangutans that are the more solitary ones, when they are alone, they were expressing a lot more curiosity than a chimpanzee or a bonobo who are used to living and used to find themselves in, in group settings. And I just have to make a small excursion to the mongooses here. I'm not going to talk about them, but I just want to show this is just really pilot results and we're finding exactly the same kind of patterns. So we have meerkats that are highly cooperative breeders. They are less explorative than the yellow mongooses who live in small family groups. And then we have the slender mongooses completely solitary on their own. And, and this kind of pattern is, is the same. And we also find a difference between captive and wild as one would expect. But yeah, that was just an exercise excursion. So uh, my friend Laura has shown that orangutan curiosity also boosts the way they solve problems, not only in this honey trap, but also in a variety of different contexts like inhibition control, reversal learning and um, flexibility, so on. So I was wondering if that then also generalizes to the other apes. And so we tested them on three different problems again. There's an inhibition control, you can't really see it, but there's a banana and the, the banana is behind a small hole. On the side of the box is a big hole and they have to detour and inhibit the first impulse to try to get through it right away and go around. And you have the honey box where they have to find out that you can't go through a curve with a static stick. You need a bendable little rope that we provide on the floor. And then we have a reversal learning task where they are learning one side of the reward and then we switch and we're measuring how quickly, they, how many trials they need to reverse, uh, learn a reverse pattern. And uh, we have slightly less sample size here because apes need to participate on their own will and not all of them want to come when you want them. And so this is the reason for that. But what we find is that there's absolutely no species difference in how they do in the tasks, which was kind of uh, surprising first, but then I thought that's also cool because uh, you could argue that the chimpanzees and the bonobos were curious, less curious simply because they are less comfortable between, by being away from the groups and we test them. And in these tasks, they are away from the group much longer even 
so and they were doing fine. We then find that within species, the variation in curiosity would slightly make them better, but this is not significant. So I just want you to take it with a little bit of a, a pinch of, of salt. I still want to show it though, because I think maybe with a larger sample size, we would get the effect. So this would then be supportive of what we have found in the orangutans. Between species, again, again, non-significant, we but only speculating because we found this result that the more social species would do rather better, which then again fits a lot when you talk about the intelligence hypothesis about social and social learning affecting skills. Um, so if we step back, what does this all imply? I think it's pretty much showing that just like the apes, I would say also as humans, we actually very much evolved to be cautious and careful rather than curious. And that the biological function to foster learning is to, um, that that indeed is the reason for curiosity, is to facilitate learning skills from role models and peers in a safe context. And so, then you go, what? what about humans? Aren't they the most curious of all? And you know, everybody with a toddler knows that they don't care about if it's risky or dangerous or anything. You know, they just jump off the cliff. But I think that humans have had a high selection pressure on not ever, ever leaving a kid in that situation. So there's a, you know, we're cooperative breeders, we're always there watching, we are part of their uh, surrounding, not letting that happen. And so what we do as primatologists, we like to speculate and put our research into a bigger context. So let's go back in time and think about what this tells us about our evolutionary history. So it's always, often been noticed that human technology was remarkably slow, especially if we look at stone tool development throughout different ages, like stone artifacts. And this suggests that for a very long time, the hominins were actually quite similar to the great apes, that we wouldn't walk around and explore and invent things just like that because we were curious about them, but we might have much, much more relied on imitation and learning from others. And then suddenly, Throughout the Upper Paleolithic Revolution, we find a lot more creativity in the human lineage. So you see not only increase in, in different types of tools and more sophisticated tools, but also a lot of more creative things in terms of art and stuff. So one explanation for this increase is that this reluctant explorer was actually turned into a curious one. And the reason that has been speculated is that because of some of the inventions, we could become one of the predators in our own niche. So all those, it sort of leveled down the danger of our own habitat. And because of that, we are much more free to also uh, unleash the curiosity potential being there through our niche demanding skill learning that demands curiosity. And so with that, I'd like to just say that I think that by studying these things in our closest living relatives and also other animals, we can look at the evolutionary reasons of curiosity and how much they might be a continuum and what factors actually are, are the reason for our species being so curious. And also as a appraisal to this workshop, I think in order to do so, we really need a lot of interdisciplinary ways of looking at it and projects that tackle this more complex topic in all kinds of ways. And before I stop, I would like to briefly jump in with a little advertisement because we are organizing a culture conference in Zurich in November. And it's a free conference, so it doesn't cost anything. And I thought it might even be of interest or relevance for some of you. So you'd be more than welcome to join us. We have some really exciting plenary speakers that also spanning very interdisciplinary topics. Yeah, so welcome there. And thank you for listening. And I'm very happy to take your questions.